Father, thank you so very, very much for all your wonderful love and the attention that you have showed us today. It humbles us to know that the ear of the Almighty is bending down to us, that the mouth of the Almighty is speaking to us. The Holy Spirit is here dwelling with us, that your servants, the angels, who could be enjoying this magnificent and uh, never-ending universe are here serving us and ministering to us today. So Lord, as we open your word, that is exactly what we want you to do. We want you to open your word, to speak mightily, to influence us, to change us, to mold us, and to convict us. In Jesus' name, amen. So there is a certain summer camp that I won't name today uh, in North American Division in the United States that sits on an 800 plus acre property and has a magnificent blessing. On this property sits a natural spring. It is massive. And I mean really massive. This natural spring pumps out about 120 million gallons of fresh, clean water a day. 120 million gallons a day. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, about a decade ago, they were approached by a bottling company, a water bottling company. And the company provided them a, uh, an offer. And they said, we will build our own backside driveway. We will uh, build a small plant out in an obscure, unused area of your massive property. We will not be a bother to you. We will stay out of your way. But we would like to bottle some of your water. We will take about 15% of your water a day, which equals about 18 million gallons, leaving still 100 million gallons a day for the camp. We will only take about 15% of your water, and in return, we will offer you a percentage of our income that would equal somewhere above $1 million a year. Can you imagine what a summer camp could do with a million dollars extra a year? How many lives of children they could bless? How many activities? How cheap they could make uh, tuition so that every child could go to summer camp? A million extra dollars. So you can imagine, put yourself in their shoes, just imagine how excited this camp must have been. What a blessing, what an opportunity. So the camp board got together. They discussed it. They spoke with conference lawyers. They spoke with engineers. What would be the environmental impact on our camp? They went really serious. They looked in every corner of, of the law books and policies. And, you know, they looked at everything, making sure that this would be a good decision. And everything looked like a perfect green light. A wonderful blessing, a huge experience, and a, just this tremendous opportunity. And with no, I shouldn't say no, with incredibly little risk. I mean, this was a huge blessing. So overwhelmingly, unanimously, this board camp, uh, this camp board approved the motion. But as you know, within the Adventist church, big decisions like that also need a conference permission. So they approved the motion and sent it to their conference executive committee. The executive committee spent time looking into it, making sure, you know, overturning every little rug and making sure just making sure that nothing got by, that this was a good opportunity. They agreed. This is a blessing. This is amazing. And so the executive committee sent word down to the camp board 
that they have approved the motion pending one minuscule, tiny change. The request from the executive committee was that the water bottling company close its doors on Sabbath. That Sunday through Friday, they could, they could run their, their plant, their building, do their own thing. It would look like a great blessing. But on Sabbath, because it's our property and we believe in the seventh day Sabbath, we believe, water bottling company, that God will bless you tremendously if you do so. Your employees will experience the blessing. Your administrators, your finances, that God will bless you even more if you close your doors on Sabbath. The water bottling company said, no. They said, we can't. We have to be in operation seven days a week. Now, I don't believe, I could be wrong, I don't believe that the camp board told the executive committee what I'm about to tell you until after the story was over. I don't believe they got permission from the executive committee, but the camp board decided, you know, water is life. It's vital. Jesus is the water of life. Let's go ahead and tell them they can. Let's tell them that they can go ahead, come on campus, They could work on Sabbaths. Let's move forward. And I don't believe that the executive committee knew this. I've heard this story through the rumor weeds, but I don't believe they told the executive committee. So they went forward. They went to the bottling committee, uh, to the company, and they said, okay, we'll accept your proposal. We'll accept uh, your contract. You don't have to close on Sabbath. And so the water bottling company went right to action. They started drawing up the paperwork, working with their lawyers uh, so that they could make this a final deal. And in the meantime, they sent their own engineers to now start planning things. They were on the camp. They were going to plan where to build, what to do. They were working with the camp about where the uh, driveway should go, where they should you know, funnel the water in and out of. And so they began working. The first day of work, the very first day, no papers had been signed yet. But while they were still planning, the very first day that the engineers showed up, it wasn't the Sabbath that I know of. Good question. But the engineers came, and they they met at the office with the the camp director, and they walked out to the spring. And the spring was dry. And I don't mean dry. I mean Yuma Sand Dune Drive. (laughs) There wasn't even mud on their shoes. I just heard this story recently, and I'm thinking as I'm listening to this story, I'm thinking, this is like out of the Bible. And it still happens in today's world. So the engineers and the board director, or the camp director, they walk out there, it is dry. Not an ounce, not a speck, not a thing of mud. It is dry. This spring, as far as they know, has been flowing abundantly for hundreds of years. Native American stories go back like hundreds of years to this spring providing for the native communities. And the day that the engineer showed up, it was dry. So, amen. So, they huddle, and they're like, they're scratching their head. You know the camp director knows what's going on. And I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't know what he says. I don't know, or she says. I don't know what they say. But you know, he or she knows what's going on. The bottling company may be ignorant, confused. This is strange. What an anomaly. What's going on? The engineers processing things in their engineering brain. And I don't say that condescendingly. I wish I was smart enough to be an engineer. All the facts and figures and what is the, you know, how could this happen? You know at least somebody in that circle knew what was going on. 
But as they're huddled together, they decide, you know, this is probably just a weird, strange anomaly. Let's let it settle. Let's meet again next week. They come back out the next week. Guess what? Dry. A week of dryness now. Now it's cracking the dirt. It's so dry. The company looks at the director and says, sorry, we're out. And they went and opened on another property next door. And as far as I know, they get water seven days a year, I mean seven days a week, just fine. The camp director brought back the news to the board what had happened. And together, they said, Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us of what we've done. We walked outside of your blessings. And the very next day, slowly, but the water was back. Slowly. They measured it. It, God didn't bring back the abundance immediately, but slowly. now today they're back to their 120 or so million gallons a day. Praise the Lord. Because I'm going to be starting a series on the Sabbath, we, I don't want to miss that point before we get to today's agenda, today's lesson. I want you to think of what the water bottling company missed out on had they accepted God's blessing via the church. Had the church worked with God and had the community, the world, the bottling company said, okay, we'll give your plan a shot. I don't know because I'm not God, but I just imagine that when the engineer showed up that day, not a Sabbath because they would have been following the rule, that there would have been 200, 300 million gallons of water a day. Maybe so much water they could have funneled it to Lake Mead and into the Colorado River for us. <laughs> a lot of water would have been coming out abundantly. Imagine the blessings that that... We, we wouldn't even know of Dasani water today. But whatever company this was, that's the water we'd all be drinking today if they had followed God's plan. But for today's discussion, I want you to know what really took place. The reason that the camp was not blessed was that they parked the car. God was moving. Amen? Amen? God was moving. God was blessing, and not just blessing, but abundantly. But the camp decided, let's park the car. And our sermon title, if you've looked at the bulletin, is God Will Not Drive Parked Cars. They decided to press forward without God, to live outside of his guidelines of blessings, to move without his regulations and limits that he has set for us to live life abundantly. Mm -hmm. Family, when we press forward without God, we cannot go anywhere. We cannot. We are not strong enough. We are not righteous enough. We are not faithful enough. I don't have to ask you if you are. I know you are not. I know I am not. We are not collectively. You could add up all of our righteousness, and we don't have 120 million gallons of righteousness. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is like what? Filthy rags. We cannot move without God. We park our car that he wants to drive forward, that he wants to press forward when we do not work with God. Grab your Bible. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, a very famous verse. I believe you have read this verse many, many times. Second Chronicles, chapter 7. Solomon has just built a temple for God. 
magnificent, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, Solomon's temple. He has blessed it. He has prayed over it. He has given it to God. And God appears a second time to Solomon where he says these words. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I love the di digital age. My sermon today, I'm not set up to a printer yet. My sermon's right here on my phone. I love the digital age. No problem with Bibles being on phones. No problems with you sliding your fingers. But there's still something really cool about pages turning in the church. I love that. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14. God says this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This verse is so immensely powerful. There's so much in there. We could spend a year just on that verse. I want you to think about it. Let's identify the characters. God is speaking, but whom, to whom is he speaking? His people. But he describes his people, doesn't he? What kind of people are his people? They are called by his name. We're optimistic today. I love it. We're only paying attention to the good news. If, if you humble yourselves. They're not humble. They're wicked. They're living in sin. They must turn from their ways. But God does not forsake them. He does not say, Solomon, if your children don't wise up, I am going to smack them across the head. If it was Greek philosophy, it would be, I'm going to throw a lightning bolt under their tail. But he says, my people, Amen. called by my name. Amen. 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 It doesn't excuse their sin. He doesn't ignore their sin. He doesn't say, hey, they're my people. It's cool. He says, they're my children. They are called by my name. If they cleanse themselves of sin, if they get rid of that sin, if they turn from their sin, boy, oh boy, have I got a plan for you. Amen. In other words, he's saying, my people have parked the car. They have parked the car. If they'll put it in the drive and let me drive, I have got a vision for them. I have a mission for them. We are going to do amazing things. However, they've got to unpark the car. What is he saying? He's saying, I will not drive a parked car. We are not going a step further, an inch closer to heaven, to the mission, until they unpark this car. Give me permission to work in their lives and we will go forward. Amen. But I'm not driving a parked car. Amen. Family, let's not park the car. Amen. Let's get going. Amen. Let's get to work. Amen. And it begins with humility. If they humble themselves, That's right. That's right. it begins with the prayer of the heart. Lord, I've parked the car long enough. I'm a work in progress, Lord. I need help. Let's go. I invite you in, Lord. Let's roll. It begins with humility. 
if we move forward with God, if we walk in his ways, we will live abundantly. You as an individual will live abundantly if God is driving your life. Your family will live abundantly if God is driving you forward. Our church will move mountains. Sorry, we don't have mountains. Where I'm coming from, where I came from, we don't have mountains. But we have mountains, don't we? Sin, temptation, laziness distractions. We've got mountains. Our community has mountains. They've got vices. They've got anger. They've got horrible diseases and problems. They affect us too. You know what I mean? And they're grasping. They don't know what to do. The world right now is crying out for Jesus, but they don't know how to find him. We do. If we let God drive this ministry, we will live and grow abundantly. But we can't do it by ourselves. I want you to know that God loves to work with us with us. Even when God works alone in his almighty power, it is still teamwork because God only will do that if we humble ourselves and let him do that. God wants to work with you. And so your new pastor stands with that same philosophy. I want to work, but I will not do it alone. I want to work with you so that it's not I and you, but we with him. The threefold cord. Thank you, Julie, for that verse. One of my favorite verses. The threefold cord. Pastor, church, God. And it will not be broken. This is John's major theme. Turn with me to John 6. In John's rendition of the feeding of the 5,000, this is John's major focus. Teamwork with God. John chapter 6. The Gospel of John. Chapter 6. As you turn there, here's your bit of trivia. Outside of the Passion Week, Outside of the final seven days of Jesus' life, in all of the 33 years prior, there is only one story, one, that's it, that is in all four Gospels. Not his birth, not his baptism, not uh, this miracle or that miracle. The only story outside of the Passion Week that is in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. The only story. What does that tell you about the story? Really important. Really important. important Because all four gospel writers decided, oh boy, of all 33 years, this story's got to be in my book. All of them. But I want you to catch John's theme. We're going to read several verses, and you'll start to get the, the theme before we even get to the end. It's so clear and so powerful, so uh, evident, you'll catch it. Let's start this story at verse 5. We'll start with verse 5 and 6. Keep it open, though. We're going to discuss, but we're going to keep reading through. John 6, 5 and 6. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Before we read verse 6, does Jesus already know what he's going to do? So why is he asking Philip? Because he wants Philip involved, doesn't he? In fact, we don't even have to assume that he knows. We don't have to use our logic he knows. Read verse 6. But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
Jesus asks questions that he already knows the answers to. Because he's all-knowing. Because he's God. He knew the answer, but he put the question in front of Philip because he wanted Philip's involvement. Hey, Philip, what do you think? I've been preaching all day. He's long-winded. Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you, and you're going to discover this, I'm long-winded at times. Amen. I love lunch. But I can wait if I can feed here for a little bit. He says, okay, Philip, I've been preaching a long time. My children are hungry. What should we do? And I want you to notice what Philip does. You know what he does? The math. He parks the car. <laughs> notice, verse 7, he does the math. <laughs> Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. He does the math. He's got the engineering brain. We don't have enough. We don't have enough money. We can't get enough bread. We don't even have enough for everyone to eat a little. By the way, 5,000 men were there. Plus women, plus children. We estimate 10,000 plus were there. 200 denarii is not enough to feed the 10,000, Lord. What does Philip do? He, put on, he didn't just put on the brakes. He put on the emergency brake. He parks the car. We can do nothing, Lord. We are not good enough. We don't have enough. We're in trouble. Er, slams on the brakes. God won't drive a parked car family. Amen. But the story is not over. Amen. It doesn't go to the next story. Philip doesn't get the last word. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. Verse 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? He's, he's squeaking on the brakes. He's riding his brakes. But he still left the door open. He's faithful in his faithlessness. <laughs> He's presenting an impossible situation that his logic says we can't do this, but he still gives it to God. He humbles himself. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves. Lord, it isn't enough, but here you go. By the way, who brought their lunch that day? Never forget that for this world right now in 2021, us old folks, we don't have the lunch for today. The young people are the secret to our success. Amen. They know this world. They know this digital age. And I say young people, I say our children, our 20-somethings, our, our, our young 30s, anyone younger than me, I'm 41. I try to pretend I got a grasp on it, and I don't. But they've got the lunch. They brought the lunch. It may be small. We might think it's small, but they know how to work in today's world. Our youth are our secret. We'll get to this later. We're going to talk about the Sabbath and the family. We're going to talk about our kids, I promise you. But don't let that lesson leave us today. Our children, our youth, our, our young adults, they're our ticket to this world. They brought the lunch that we don't have. They've got the ingredients that we don't have. Amen? amen. I want them to hear the amen. amen. Because our amen is telling them we're going to put you to work too. Amen. We're going to love you and care for you. Just bring what you got. It may be little experience, it may be a little bit of money, but we're going to fund what you want to do. We're going to bring what you want to do to the Lord. Amen? amen? That amens our contract with our young people. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? B verse 10. 
Verse 10 does not say, and Jesus said, oh, well, let's go home. Amen. Verse 10, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Did Jesus, who was just preaching, all the people can hear him. Did Jesus say, okay, everyone, here's what we're going to do. Sit down. Is that what he said? No, he tells his disciples. By the way, the disciples, you know who they are? They're the church. Those listening is the community of Yuma. But to the 12 disciples, they're us in the story. And Jesus says to them, hey, guys, I know they're here to see me. I know they're here to listen to me, but you go have them sit down, break them in groups. One of the other gospels actually tells us that they broke them in smaller groups. The church is organized for service. They break into groups so that it's easier for the 12 to distribute what they're about to distribute. The church is organized for service. Jesus does not say, hey, guys, sit down. He says, hey, church, go tell them to do what I'm telling you to do. I will instruct you. I will train you. You go to them and have them sit. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to who? The to the disciples. And the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Amen. 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 Some of us like to eat, and there was as much as they wanted. Amen. Yes. They were full. Did they live abundantly? They lived abundantly. They brought... This child's lunch. If you're picturing it in your mind, don't think big bass or trout and big loaves of bread. Think sardines and crackers, maybe. It's a little boy's lunch. Well, I've seen the youth eat, though. They can eat a lot. <laughs> Probably this small little lunch bag, right? Lunch pail. Remember the old lunch pails, you know, the metal ones? Click, click, click. This little lunch pail. Hey, Lord, I've got, I've got sardines and crackers for you. But to the Lord, it wasn't about the number of things in the lunch pail. It was about the faith of the, of the heart. It's about the faith of the heart. Lord, I only have a little. What can you do with it? Ho, 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 ho. Watch me. Lord, I only have this tiny little bit. What can you do with it? That's all I need. I needed your faithful heart. Watch out. That's right. That's right. But it is organized. It's not just free for all. It's not just Jesus, you know, throwing things into the crowd. It doesn't have little t-shirt cannon shooters if you go to sporting events, right? He gives to the church. Step back. The church provides a small offering. I don't know who the big breadwinner is of this church. The family or families who finance the church the most. But I'll tell you what, the most is still little compared to what God has. No kidding. Amen. No kidding. So you could give a million dollars a year or more and it's still change in God's couch. Okay. So we give what little we have. I'm hitting all the topics today. I love tithe. You know why? Because it's 10%. It's 10% it's, 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 it's across the board. 10%. The, 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 the higher up, you know, the, the more affluent don't find tax breaks with God to give only 1%. While, while those of us, our family who are struggling have to still figure out 10%. 10% is 10% for everyone. It's fair. God has organized the church for service. So we give this little bit and say, okay, God, I'm, I don't have enough faith, but I trust that you can do something with this. But here you go. And God provides 
more to the local church, the disciples, and then they go out and distribute to the community, and the community eats so much they're all full. With leftovers. Hey, I'm in charge here. I haven't read verse 12 yet. <laughs> Let's get to it. Verse 12. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Family, there are people out there who need Jesus. I, I know there are people here who need Jesus. I need Jesus. But for the lesson, there are people outside of here who need Jesus. Our goal should be that no one is lost. No one. I don't want anyone who lives in this greater Yuma area to be lost. Not a single person. I want, it may not happen, but our goal should be that when the final crisis comes, there is not a single person in this greater area who will break the Sabbath. Amen. That when city councils across the nation and world are saying, are we going to pass that Sunday law? Every person in Yuma is saying, uh-uh, let's keep going. We're going to follow the Lord. Our goal is, May, I, I, we can't shoot too high for this, friends. Amen. Our goal is going to be that no one is lost. Amen. No one is lost. Verse 13. By the way, you caught the point. Did Jesus gather the, the remnants? No. no, he sent the church. Go get them. Right? Okay. Verse 13. Therefore, they, the church, gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. There were what, Victor? Leftovers. leftovers. Basketfuls of leftovers. More leftovers than what they started with. More leftovers than what they started with. Which means that if we follow this recipe, if we follow this recipe, we will live so abundantly in the Yuma area that the entire Arizona conference will be blessed by it. Amen. That the work will continue in Payson and Holbrook on all 23 reservations throughout Phoenix and Tucson, Flagstaff, Sedona, Lake Havasu, the entire conference will be blessed by what is happening here because there will be leftovers here. And we'll say, Lord, we'll say, Ed Keys, here, we have too many things going on here. Here, be blessed by it. We will have leftovers. Family, is this the story we're going to live? Amen. We are at a crossroads. Not a bad crossroad. I've known Pastor George for the entire time I had been in Arizona and, and since I've left Arizona. He came 14 years ago about. I came to Arizona about 14 years ago. We have been here. I was on the northeast side of Arizona. He was in the southwest. But we've been in the conference about as long other than till I, I was a traitor and I left for a bit. I know he did good work here, family. I know the man personally. When we would go to camp meeting, it was one of the few times here that we could get together and hang out and talk. And Mel, wonderful work here. Wonderful work here was done in this area. But George was always, Pastor George, always one of the people I specifically looked forward to talking to. Every year I ran, uh, I was part of the security team. I would always take time to go sit in his area. He was the greeter at the gate at camp meeting. I'd always make sure I ran my golf cart down when he wasn't so busy. And every year I'd get my PCT update. Hey, how's the trail going? Because he'd do it in parts, right? Every year he'd get a little bit more and a little bit more. So I'd say, hey, how'd it go this hiking season? He'd fill me in. 
I know that pastors before have done wonderful work. Wonderful work. I'm not correcting what has been done. But I'm just saying, let's go. Let's keep driving. Let's push it. 2020 should have woken us up. I hope it has. The Lord is coming soon. God won't drive a parked car. I want John 6 to be our story. If, if gospel was still being written, if the Bible was still written, I want what we're about to do in Yuma to have been in the favor of God that someone wrote it down by the inspired pen. If the Bible was still being written, I want this to be our story. The Lord organized us for service, and we went out and we distributed, we worked, we ministered, we loved, we cared, and wow, did God bless abundantly. So I ask you, why can't our church be busy 15 hours a day every single day? And you might be thinking, I don't have that much time on my hands. Yes, young man. You're right. Thank you for that. But, but our church doors would still be open on Sabbath. But thank you for keeping that perspective. You might be thinking, I don't have 15 hours a day. Together we do. Does Pastor Phil not expect to ever sleep or ever see his family? Is he never going to go home? He's going to be here 15 hours a day? Did he just lay out the agenda that he's going to be here 15 hours a day working? I love this pastor. He's going to work so hard for us. Did you hear me say, I'll be here 15 hours a day? Why can't we be active 15 hours a day in the ministry of the Lord? Our school, community service, evangelism, pathfinders, Bible study, a men's tea group and a woman's prayer breakfast. Why is it always the opposite? Why is it always a men's prayer breakfast and a woman's tea group? Amen. Why can't we be ministering all the time throughout the day? Because we have enough people here, don't we? You don't have to be involved in everything. I don't have to be, well, I have to be involved, but I don't have to be there for everything. Right? Do we have a work to do? We have a work to do, so let's do it. God won't drive a parked car. Family, if we believe in the power of God, we have zero excuses to not do everything so that none are lost. In fact, if God is in charge, if we humble ourselves and let him drive our individual lives, our families, and our church ministries, we will do mighty things for him. Because he will do mighty things through us. Amen. You may be thinking, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. My marriage is broken. I'm broken. I'm broke. I'm too old. I'm too weak. I'm this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I have one more story for you before we close. Thursday, Wednesday night. What day is today? I don't even know. Today's Sabbath, right? <laughs> Thursday night. Thursday night, we had left Bishop about 1 p.m. We had to drive through the Loma Linda Redlands area on our way to Yuma. We stopped for a little bit, saw some friends of ours, and we got back on the road. I had the U-Haul truck. We were pulling a car trailer on the U-Haul truck. Our Volkswagen was on the back of that car, uh, on that trailer. My son was behind me. Felix is 18. He was behind me driving our Ford Taurus. My wife, Sharon, was behind him driving our Ford Focus. Together we did it. We were working slowly, getting here. We were exhausted leaving Loma Linda. We were tired, regretting that we had got a hotel in Indio, wishing we had booked a hotel in Loma Linda so we could rest. We chatted about it. We talked about it. And we said, all right, we can do this. It's about one hour. Sl driving the slow truck, an hour and 10 minutes. We can suck it up. Let's get there. 
That way we only have a two hour or so drive in the morning to email. Let's, let's do it. So we got on the road. We got to Beaumont. Who knows where Beaumont is? I, I didn't know until Thursday night where Beaumont was. <laughs> we get on the road. We're driving. My phone is face down on the dashboard and it begins to ring. And instantly, it's 1030 at night, instantly I start saying in my head, please don't be Felix, please don't be Felix, please don't, because I know if it's Felix who's right behind me, there's an issue. I love my son, he loves me, but he's not going to just call me and say, hey dad, how's it going? <laughs> instantly I know, oh, something's wrong, don't be Felix, don't be Felix. I grab the phone, I looked it over, I look over, and it says Felix. Oh, hello? Dad, there are sparks coming off of this car trailer. Oh, no. Okay. I hit the brakes. We're in the middle lane. I start moving over. There's an exit half a mile. Start moving over. Try, well, thinking about trying to move over so we can get to the exit. When all of a sudden, boom! Tire explodes. We get over. We start getting off the off-ramp. You hear it. We pull around quickly. We stop. I jump out, and I see Felix and Sharon out jumping out of their cars, and Sharon's like, do you need water? And I look down. There are flames shooting from the trailer. The trailer has lit on fire. Brake line. I, 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 we think I started a fire causing the tire to blow. We'd been driving all day. We'd been drinking water all day. We have like one thermos of water left. I throw that at the fire. It does nothing. Still burning. I start thinking about the car, getting the car off. What, am I, what are we going to do? I'm like, hey, guys, is there a fire extinguisher anywhere? There's a, there's a gas station, Mini Mart. They go, Sharon and, and Felix go running into the Mini Mart. Can I tell them this part of the story? They go running into the Mini Mart. And they're looking for a fire extinguisher, looking for water. And there are customers, but there's no cashier. And so she yells out, where's the cashier? And someone yells, we don't know. And so she grabs water and runs out of the store. My wife is a thief. <laughs> we were telling our youngest, oh, Felix is a thief too. We, t we were telling our youngest, who's in uh, Northeast Arizona, with grandma and grandpa, You'll, you met Titus in January, if you were here in January, and then Eliza you haven't met yet, They're help, they help every summer grandma and grandpa take care of their cows in the mountains, so they'll be here in about a month. We're telling our story to our youngest, Titus, and he says, Mom, I'll never look at you the same again, you're a thief. <laughs> I'm outside, pulling my hair out, trying to figure out what to do, and someone yells, some stranger yells, there's a fire extinguisher in every U-Haul truck. It's behind your seat. So I go running back to the cab, and I throw the seats forward. My dog, our dog, Pug, Miko, our Pug is in there. She's freaking out. She's heard the explosion. She's, she's, she's panicking. She doesn't know what's going on, and I'm like pushing her away. She wants to be held. I'm like, get out of here. I'm trying to get the seat forward. I get both seats forward, and I'm literally throwing triangles, the little you know, emergency triangles. I'm throwing them. There's no fire extinguisher. Then you hear, boom, a second tire has exploded. Then moments later, boom, a third tire explodes. And in my head, I'm still in the cab, in my head, I'm envisioning my whole Volkswagen in flames. I come back out, the thieves are back with their water. <laughs> they have put out the fire now at this point. They've put out the fire. And as things start to settle, just for a moment, as we're kind of staring blankly at each other, like, what just happened? Are we all okay? I think I'm alive. No one was hurt by the blowing tire. Passat not touched. Flames were all underneath the trailer, didn't get to the car. All of a sudden, this gentleman drives up with his forklift completely unbeknownst to us, the Lord 
had allowed it to happen at an exit where we would pull off and stop and never look around, we stopped literally in the very front of a tow truck company. (laughs) 11 o'clock at night, this guy happens to be in his office at the very moment, and he specifically, he works, I'm sure, with lots of cars, he works specifically with U-Haul. He knows how to work the system, how to work with their insurance, the whole bit. He pulls up with his forklift. He goes, guys, I got this. He introduces himself. If you're ever in Beaumont, Dom's trucking or Dom's towing, go give the guy a hug. You know he's a good guy because he's bald, by the way. (laughs) He says, I got this. You guys are okay. Our hearts are racing. There's tears in eyes, we're hugging, we're just like numb. We've been running for days, you know, packing things. We'd hardly slept. We had slept on the ground the night before because all of our bed was in the truck. We only got like three or four hours of sleep the night before. You know, like I said at the beginning, I mean, days. We'd got 15 hours total in the last three days. And we're just like shaking and, and just beyond, beyond tired. But the Lord had us pull over right in a spot where he knew we could have help. He gets our, he, he helps Felix to get the car off. He gets the trailer pulled in. He tells us, guys, don't worry about the car. It's safe here. In other words, we don't have to wait for you all to come get us. We don't have to wait for a new tow trailer. He says, guys, it's okay. I got you. I said, Dom, we're moving to Yuma. I've got stuff to unload. I've got church tomorrow. I'm exhausted. I may not be back till Sunday or Monday to get my car. He goes, I don't care. It's okay. I'll keep my eye on it. Your car's safe. He parks it in front of his building. I talked to U-Haul Insurance yesterday. The first phone call, by the way, I've made in my new office. We were waiting for, we had done all of our paperwork for the house. We were waiting for, uh, you know, to, to get to move in. So we came here, and I'm on the phone with the U-Haul Insurance. They call Dom while I'm on hold. And they come back, and they said, hey, we, we've talked to Dom. You know, uh, he's, he's a good guy. And, uh, and he said he's, he's not charging you guys storage fees. I was going to say, well, no, you're going to get charged storage fees, not me. It was your trailer that exploded. But nonetheless, Dom's like, hey, I'm not going to charge them. Please give them the news. They can come Monday or Tuesday. It's good. I'm not going to charge them for that. Ten-hour trip. This could have happened anywhere. It happened right where God allowed it to happen. I want you to know this morning, if you're feeling like you're not good enough for the ministry of the church, if you're not smart enough, you're not talented enough. If your marriage is broken, if your family is broken, that's why we're going to start our series, our, this, my time here, with the Sabbath and with, uh, and with marriage. Amen. Because I know life is really stressful right now. I know things are hard right now. In the last two years, I've had more and more families come forward privately and say, our marriage is falling apart, our kids are falling apart, our Our finances are falling apart because the devil knows his time is short. Family, I want you to know that God can drive a broken car, a broken trailer. He can drive a burning trailer, a bent trailer. He can't drive a parked car. But whatever you bring, he can drive. If you're broken, if you're burning down, if things are bad, he can drive it. And he'll bring you to the place that you need to be. He'll bring you to Dom's towing. (laughs) In that crowd of the, the disciples, a Judas was there. And he still distributed to the crowds through Judas, who was still in the valley of decision at this point. A loud mouth, sarcastic Peter was in that crowd. And God distributed abundantly to the crowd. The work is not. It has never been, nor will it be our work. It's his work 
done through us. So I want your ideas. Every single idea from every single one of us, and especially those on, on YouTube. We've got a lot of great family and friends, don't we, who, who are at home. Every single idea that you have. We may not run with every idea, but I want every single idea from every single one of us. If you have a passion, bring it to the table. If you have a loaf of bread and a tiny sardine, bring it to the table. Let's build ministry together. My prayer is that none of us park the car, that none of us, none of us say, nope, I've done enough. I can't do any more. I'm not good enough. Let's press together. Let's press forward. Let us humble ourselves and say, Lord, here's the little I have. Do great things. Let's pray. Father, I give you our hearts. We give you our wisdom. It's not good enough. We cast our cares to you. We cast our burning cars and bent trailers and all all those things that are plaguing us and weighing us down. We cast it all to you. We humble ourselves under your mighty name. We thank you that you call us by that name. We are Christians. Use us, Lord. Every single one of us. Use us for your glory. Use us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.